Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for this webinar on social protection and community support systems for inclusion of persons with disabilities. This webinar follows on from a series on um, disability inclusion which we've been running over the last 12 months which you can find on the socialprotection.org website. To begin with um, today, I would like to pay my respects to the first Australians past and present, to the original custodians on whose lands I am speaking to you from today. I acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders traditional connections to land, sea and community. And I'd like to thank them for their persistence and patience in the quest for sovereignty and for sharing their rich and long-standing culture with us all. My name is um, Felicity O'Brien and I work in the social protection section in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And I'm gonna be your moderator for the discussion tonight. First of all, I'd like to thank my daughter Isla for giving up her bedroom for me for tonight as well. <laughs> um, so tonight we'll have live captions and sign language interpretation for the event. Um, you can click on the closed captions um, button at the bottom of your screen in the menu if um, they're not showing up already. And um, the um, sign language interpreters should be pinned, but if you do want to pin their screen, you can go to the three dots at the top of the screen and hit the pin button. So we'll also be recording um, the webinar tonight, um, which will include the captions and the slides, and this will go up on the socialprotection.org website in the next week or so. This webinar comes to you through a partnership between UNICEF, the ILO, the UNPRPD program, DFAT and the ADB. Um, we'll also have a question and answer um, session after all the speakers, and we encourage you to um, share questions by using the question and answer option, which you'll see on the bottom of your screen. And if you want to make comments or share links to relevant documents as we're having the discussion tonight, you can share them in the chat box if you like too. So events over the past year have really shown a light on all kinds of inequality, including around issues of disability inclusion. In this series of um, webinars on disability um, issues, we have um, sought to draw attention to the gaps in social protection coverage for persons with a disability and highlight what is required to ensure rights-based systems, inclusive and accessible social protection systems are put in place. In today's webinar, we will be focusing on community support systems for inclusion of persons with disabilities and how social protection can finance and support these essential services. We will be diving into issues around gender in relation to the care economy and the increasing demand for long-term care and support for aging populations in many countries. COVID-19, as we know, has highlighted the great gaps we see in terms of community support services for children and adults um, with disabilities and their families, and the lack of attention to gender issues um, that um, are significant with regards to this issue. And we have a distinguished panel of expert um, speakers for you today who will be unpacking these issues for us. I'll introduce them in the order that they will be presenting. You'll see their um, biographies and um, photos up on the screen, so I won't go into too much detail, but our first um, speaker tonight will be Alex Coate from the Disability and Social Protection Policy Area. He's a specialist in UNICEF. Second of all, we'll be um, having Aaron Greenberg from UNICEF too, and he's the Regional Advisor for Child Protection in Europe and Central Asia, speaking about the care economy. Then we'll have Sawang Srisum, who's a project manager from um, Transportation for All in Thailand. And he also works for the Leonard Cheshire um, organization there. We'll have Meredith Wise, who's a senior social development specialist from the Asian Development Bank. And lastly, we'll have Tom Shakespeare, who um, is a professor at um, the um, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and he specialises in disability research and these issues. So I'll now pass over to our first speaker, Alex, and we'll get started. Thanks for joining us.
Thank you very much, uh, Felicity, for this introduction, and thank you all for joining us um, today. Um, I will start with a sort of introduction to the whole issue of community support services and social protection for community inclusion. Um, and I think we can start by basically questioning ourselves, what is support? Giving and, and receiving support is part of the human experience for all of us. Who doesn't need support to move, to make important decisions in life, to get uh, cheered up when we are low, um, childcare, and, and many other opportunities or situations in lives. And I think during COVID-19, we've all have been in situations where we either provided or receive support. Person with disability can be also both recipient and provider of support, but many of them may require a higher level and maybe more diversity, diversified type of support. For many persons with disabilities, support is an essential precondition for meaningful participation. But it's important that as for any of us, um, person with disabilities should have choice and control over their own lives. And the domain in which we, um, including person with disability, may require support is making decision, communication, uh, personal mobility and transportation, self-care, activity of daily living, access to public services, education and work. Um, and support services are critical to function and participate in the community across sector. And it goes from accessing healthcare to accessing justice and everything in between. And the level of support that we have depends on three main elements. Our level of functioning, the amount of difficulty we may have in carrying out daily activities, the barrier in, in our environment, um, at home, in the community, at school, at work, in transport. The higher and more diverse the barrier, the more individual support is needed. The level of participation that we are seeking. If we stay at home and we do not much, our level of support will be minimal for many of us. But if we seek participation, then our functional difficulties and the barrier we face will tremendously raise the level of support. And when we look at the, the place or the, the role of support in disability-related costs, which are all those costs that persons with disability are facing while trying to, to achieve basic participation, we realize that support is actually the most significant part. Um, I, on the screen, I project uh, data from New Zealand that we showed in, in previous webinar on disability-related costs, which detail for different groups of persons with disability with different functioning difficulties, the cost they would incur in seeking participation. And it excludes support delivered at the workplace or needed in the workplace. And what the graph shows is that if we look at the cost related to transport, equipment, such as assistive technology and support, support for many persons with disability, especially those with high support needs, is a very significant possible expenditure, which can represent, <coughs> sorry, up to four or five times the minimum wage. And the question is, who can afford that? And the, the graph I show now, is related to other data that we have from South Africa. And we try to see over the, the cost of disability that people face, of which support is the most important, where do you need to be in the income distribution to be able to afford? If you want to participate and you are a deaf person in South Africa, you need sign language interpreter. And if you want uh, equal participation, you will need to be in the top three person of the earning. And if you are a person with physical disabilities, with high support needs, staying at home, not doing much, um, but being safe and having the care you need, you would need to be in the top 30% of the income distribution. 
The CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, mandates states to actually ensure access to support so that people can have choice in the way in where they live and with who they live on equal basis with others and in combination with greater access to all community services. In most countries, unfortunately, this is not what's happening. Um, either because the informal support by the family is the only option, housing are not accessible, support doesn't exist in the community, or is provided by the community, but on an informal basis. Or if you want support, you can get it, but only in institution. And support might be delivered only at certain conditions. For instance, if you fulfill the, your medical treatment. And there are very uh, strong limitations to informal support. First, the lack of choice. There is a difference between I get the supports when I need it and when I want it, and I get the support when my parents are available or my sister or my neighbor is available. And that can go to when I want to go shopping to when I want to go to the toilet. And this can be a very strong restriction of uh, my, uh, my autonomy, but can be ungendering uh, in terms of safety. Families can only provide so much because of their limitation in knowledge, availability, and financial resources. When family members provide support, they usually have to stop working or reduce working or education. We know, for instance, that children in families where there are people with high support needs tend to have difficulty compared to others to complete education. The risk of burnout of the primary support person, which can lead to neglect and abuse of persons with disabilities. An increased risk of institutionalization and segregation. And as we will see, a strong issue in terms of gender equality, since women and girls are the primary support person in many cases. Across the life cycle, there are different needs. In childhood, we will need early childhood development, support to family, and progressively, as we move to teenagehood and youth, personal assistance um, to support social interaction, engagement in the community with peers. In adulthood, it could be independent living and employment services, which can be personal assistance, peer support, uh, and many others. In old age, whatever can be done as people develop progressively functional difficulties to support and maintain autonomy and to live in the community. So what social protection can do? Um, in depending in the country you are, support services fit squarely in social protection or not. It all depends the scope and the understanding that the system has of social protection. But in any case, we can see that social protection through disability assessment and support needs assessment, when they are well done, can really identify need, help case management and policy planning to develop those services. Social protection can also support piloting of non-existent services, which is the case in most low and middle income countries. It can also help the development of regulatory mechanisms such as standards, uh, contracting, licensing, and financing for services that will be delivered by NGOs or organizations of persons with disabilities. It's important to know that in high-income countries, where support services exist more, uh, publicly funded, exist more than in low-income and middle-income countries, most of those services are actually delivered by nonprofit organization or the private sector, but contracted and financed by uh, government. But it can be also providing cash transfer for first person support to adults with disabilities that will then choose who would be uh, personal assistance and will manage them. It can be also direct provision of such services, still by fostering choice for persons with disabilities. It can be also caregiver allowance for parents of children with disabilities, who may nevertheless need, for instance, respite care to sometimes take a break resource and for the child also, or the person with high support needs to be able to, um, to have uh, the, the best relationship within the care and support that is provided.
Our uh, colleagues today will give us many different uh, examples across the life cycle and context of how social protection can support the development of community support services and some of the issues that we may face. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. Um, we'll move on to our next guest speaker now. Um, Aaron, are you ready to kick off? I am ready to kick off. Thank Great. you so much. Um, I believe the presentation is being controlled by someone other than myself. So please go to the, the next slide, if you would. I'm going to zoom in a bit on the Europe and Central Asia region, which is the region I've been working in and uh, for the last four years, eight years total in my, in my life, in my professional life, um, where the most visible children in terms of disability are in the wrong service, service that needs to be eliminated, uh, institutional care. Uh, we have the highest rate of children in institutional care in the world, according to UNICEF's division of the world into regions. So if you look at the Europe and Central Asia region, the highest known rate uh, of children in institutional care globally. Over time, children with disabilities have become a higher proportion of children in institutional care in this region, because even though the numbers are high of children in institutional care across the region, um, they are declining. Um, and I'll come to that in the next slide, because there is a growing uh, universal consensus on uh, institutional care and the harm it does for children and the amount of resources it sucks up to do harm to children uh, that could go into a more diversified set of line items in a budget to support the types of services that my colleague Alex was referring to. Next slide, please. So uh, countries, as I noted, are steadily reducing the number of children in residential care in the region. Um, and here you have a little snapshot of uh, some of the countries across the region, and you see a, a wide range of disparities in this. These are self-reported numbers from governments, uh, which also tend to change over time, because um, as you'll, many of you will be aware of, governments' uh, uh, definition of institutional care uh, oftentimes uh, changes as their understanding of the scope of institutional care across different line ministries and in faith-based organizations and others increases. So um, next slide, please. Um, here we have the number of children with disabilities in public residential care at the end of the year, uh, again, showing over time, uh, you know, decreases or uh, increases, as it were, in some countries. But mostly what we see here is an inability to steadily address the issue of closure and transformation of institutional care for children with disabilities uh, in the region. And this slide is particular, particularly important, I think, because if we think about the Europe and Central Asia region, here we're looking at countries predominantly uh, which uh, are, are also uh, members of, of the EU. Uh, next slide, please. So what is community support and social services? What is the learning about um, the transformation and closure and redirecting of, inst of resources from institutions to other services? What does that look like? Um, certainly, we've seen a lot of emphasis on daycare centers, we've seen so, and I think part of that is <laughs> the resistance to move away from, from some structure at community level, um, maybe an overemphasis on daycare centers rather than in real integration. There has been a lot of focus and push to governments to look at early intervention services in the home, in the families, family counseling and support, services, community-based services, respite care, personal assistance for children, older children with special needs, 
and also for families caring for children with disabilities and other specific programs. Armenia of evaluated model of integrated social services um, shows real promise, a one window system where they've, they've brought together various streams of services, both for cash and non-cash benefits. Uh, we've seen Armenia take great strides over the course of the last 20 years or so. Um, these things do take time to uh, systematically uh, um, transform institutional care into community support services. One of the problems with institutional care is it's very hard to break down the structure. So in Armenia currently in hard to reach areas, they still have, you know, in the large municipalities, they've taken some of these larger institutions and um, retrained the staff to provide services of a different nature, but oftentimes within the same structure that isn't able to do the outreach to, um, to families in remote areas it continues to be an issue. But we've seen real progress in terms of um, an integrated provision of services to families where one sort of intake person can really get a sense of the needs and direct that way. And it seems to be showing some real, real, real progress. Georgia, um, there is a package of services provided at national level. Um, there are also, uh, there's a new child law in Georgia uh, that is uh, being operationalized, which also uh, defines real clear roles for municipal level uh, social work services with an emphasis on disability inclusion. Romania uh, has a, a model of, of a minimum service package at municipal level, which is now going to scale in Romania. Um, and which I believe, I think many believe who have followed Romania for many, many years in terms of their struggle with the legacy of uh, institutional care for the entire vulnerable population. So whether you are an adult with disabilities, a child with disabilities, a young person on the move in need of care and protection, uh, a child from a household with violence who needs an intervention and removal from that scene, that the only solution was institutional care, that they have evolved quite a bit from there, but they still have 20,000 children in institutions in Romania. Um, again, a high proportion of children with disability. I think part of the issue uh, for governments to move that forward um, is the intersectoral nature, is moving from a medical diagnosis to a social diagnosis, moving to ICF, um, really looking at truly inclusive education, an enormous challenge, it seems, for many governments to prioritize. Um, and so we have to be cognizant that effective, comprehensive support for deinstitutionalization requires other sectors to do a lot more on disability. Um, and we've seen some of that in Moldova, in North Macedonia, again in Armenia, uh, and in some other countries that I've, I've, I've noted here on the screen. Um, so there is some good practice that we can draw upon. Uh, UNICEF is doing a multi-country evaluation starting in 2022 of at least seven countries across the region in their experience of trying to advance comprehensive reforms for institutional care, looking particularly uh, at children who tend to get left behind in those reforms, children with disability, children from ethnic minority backgrounds, and children who have experienced uh, uh, grave harm, uh, violence, abuse, and exploitation in, in their older years. Next slide, please. I want to zero in a little bit on, on Moldova, um, you know, and, and coming back to, to, the, to the topic of this webinar, social protection, social service reform, reform of a system, which is largely held, not always, but largely held by the social affairs ministries, which in countries are responsible for the range of services, not all of them, but a range of services that we're, we're quite concerned with in terms of their availability, their accessibility, their quality. Um, you see that children in residential care from 2002 to 2020 <clears throat> decreased from 2100 to 350 uh, with a corresponding uh, 
decrease of children with disabilities in residential care uh, uh, being being quite quite high as well. Um, and you know what 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 did they do here? You know how did they divide that up? And and let's start by saying that institutions are highly costly. I've been involved myself in two government-led reforms on institutional transformation and closure as a part of a broader social service sector reform. And the cost of institutions is oftentimes a lot higher than we all think. These are recurring costs of a line ministry. They are costs that are budgeted for. So if we can get these ministries and these actors, which, which they are doing, to look at that transformation, part, capture the costs that we're going to institutional care, to resource these more diverse line items in a budget, um, real change can happen. Daycare centers, again, uh, I'd be happy to have a discussion about the overuse of daycare centers in some of the initial waves of the reforms, uh, a little bit controversial, uh, and I think for all the right reasons, but indeed in Moldova, they played a small, perhaps uh, appropriate role in that, in, that, in that sense. Mobile teams, this is something that Armenia has not been able to do, is to get very good services out of the centers in which they're housed, oftentimes in the largest municipalities. Personal assistance, support services for inclusive education was real in Moldova. And I think that that was a critical piece uh, of the success of their reform. Um, sign language interpretation provided based on individual requests. Again, coming back to Alex's point um, about uh, when you need it, not when it's available. Supported in independent living services, community home services, respite care. So really establishing a set of services on the back of that reform, um, leaving behind a legacy of uh, recurring costs that are funded on the types of services that continue need to be improved, but now exist. Next slide, please. I'm running out of time, I've been politely told. Um, so I will go quickly through this, but um, some lessons learned. Community support services um, can be introduced as a part of sectoral reforms, um, but coordination is a big issue. Um, that's no surprise, but it's it particularly challenging on the disability front. Consider children living in institutional care who need to be out of that service because of the harm it's causing them and the lack of the services that are available at community level to support them in the community. Um, and, and, and the challenges of that. Uh, I think, as I've said, there've been more emphasis on some services, daycare centers, um, you know, where there may have been a bit of a, a, an overdoing it in some countries. Um, but these services are really important uh, if they are appropriate in their responsiveness to local need. Um, emphasis on pilots, uh, really trying to get more sustainable work done. Uh, and that means facing the music on, on the political ownership and getting that right. Um, and I think I just want to end by saying that uh, disability assessment reforms are ongoing, but you know, oftentimes they're not aligned. So we'll have um, a disability reform happening in a country around inclusive education that isn't linked to the social reforms on deinstitutionalization or on sector reforms on social welfare uh, that isn't looking at the boarding schools in run by the Ministry of Education and whether they're appropriate and whether they're still needed and the resourcing of boarding schools and how that can be redirected in, some, in many cases to inclusive education uh, within mainstream schools. Um, obviously COVID-19 impacted everyone. <laughs> um, including particularly children with disabilities. Um, but I think it also gives us an opportunity to put the spotlight back on the issue, uh, to underscore the need to accelerate deinstitutionalization with real meaningful investment in diversified services at community level. Uh, and that's exactly where UNICEF is putting its energy now in Europe and Central Asia. And I believe that's the last slide. Is there one more? I don't think so. If I'm, if we, all right, I've said this though. So uh, maybe uh, I will um, yeah, move to the next slide, uh, which I won't go through in detail because I understand I, I may be over time. But 
I deeply believe that what we need to make a difference is support to governments in costing within their system and recognizing that in many cases, there is very difficult to get new money, it's very challenging to get new resources. Uh, if we think about a minister going to the cabinet of ministers meetings and putting together their budget for the coming year, coming fiscal, fiscal year, especially social services, it is very rare that you can, you can see uh, increases. Uh, this is also why I think the efficiency gains that can be uh, obtained within these ministries in terms of redirecting existing resources is a, is a powerful argument uh, that can also help attract new resources. Um, Public-private partnerships, I am all for, uh, but I believe ultimately um, it's the government's accountability uh, and really helping them maximize all the opportunities they have to make better synergies between cash and services, to look at how you include assistive technology in some of the, uh, the frontline service relationships that uh, these social affairs ministries, these health ministries have with communities is critical. Um, and of course, partnerships, we couldn't do it without the partnerships. Next slide, please. There are a bunch of references for the presentation. You're free to peruse yourself. Um, let me end by saying that there is a, a, few, a few controversies in this area that I didn't really speak too much about. The daycare centers I did. One thing I'd like to say before departing is that one of the, the very big um, questions is the role, if any, of residential care for children for whom families cannot support. And I mean both in terms of biological, extended, and where foster care is unavailable. Um, there is a, a big debate about this. In the child protection field, there is oftentimes a need to have emergency placement settings that are available within a six hour notice because of children who experience grave harm, violence, abuse, and exploitation. In very well-developed systems, you will have some emergency foster care placements available for that. Um, but in many cases, that, that isn't the case. Foster care is not a well-developed service. Um, so for, from a protection perspective, whether it's a child with disability who experienced grave violence or a child, any child, family, kinship, foster is critical there needs to be at some level a placement for that child. It is a slippery slope to say that because it opens the door for residential care. And we've seen some governments overbuild small residential facilities, feeling that that is a good solution for a DI agenda, for a deinstitutional agenda. So take your big institutions and just break them up into smaller ones. And that is clearly not what we're advising aiming for or suggesting. And I think we have to be very careful about that space. Um, so it's not to say that service transformation is fraught actually with uh, challenges in terms of making sure it's done well. And I think therefore participation of those who are most affected by those changes is critical. Um, I'll end on that note. Thank you for bearing with me as I passed over a few final points. Back to you, Felicity. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for covering off on the yeah complexities and nuances of um, the issue around um, institutional care. There's um, a lot for us to think about there. Um, we'd like to now hand over to our next um, speaker, Sawang, if you're ready to go. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Felicity. Uh, Persons with disabilities in Thailand um, have long yearned for community support services and social protection programs because um, we know that they can help us live independently. And in the past two decades, we have learned that any attempt to realize independent living of persons with disabilities can fail if we do not have um, adequate community support services and social protection. It was a big lesson learned for us when we started our in independent living programs and personal assistance services in Thailand 
in early 2000s when disability support was very limited. Next. Um, in Thailand, we have around 2 million persons with disabilities registered under the Ministry of Social Development and Human Security. And another number, which is 3.7 million, comes from the survey in 2017 by the um, National Statistics Office. Next. Um, in Thailand, um, we have quite a number of social protection programs and benefits for persons with disabilities. Actually, we have um, most of the essential programs, but um, the problem is the low payment. As you can see, um, our disability allowance is only 23.5 to $30 per month. Uh, and it now, uh, now um, around 1.99 million persons with disabilities are receiving it. So that means almost 100% of people with disabilities who are registered uh, receive the uh, disability allowance. And the old age and children's allowances also give kind of similar amounts. And for the PA, the government pays only $1.5 per hour for the service. Anyway, um, the, uh, one of the good things is that we have the universal coverage scheme, uh, which now covers 1.36 million uh, persons with disabilities. And the scheme um, reduces some of the disability related uh, costs on healthcare, rehabilitation, um, orientation and mobility training and assistive uh, devices. We also have other programs too, but um, I'm not giving, I'm not going into detail, the details because of the time. Next. Japan actually was the country that brought the, the concept of independent living to Thailand. Um, there were discussions in the late nineties and we could uh, start it in um, 2001 with the support from the Japan International Cooperation Agency. And after the three-year pilot projects, we could set up three um, IL. Uh, IL is uh, in independent living. So we could set up three IL um, centers in three provinces and start to uh, provide the IL services, including the PA services since um, 2004 through um, various projects. And that had always been attempts to increase the number of um, the IL centers that we had and, and, and also the number of the PAs, but we were not very successful. And up until uh, 2011, we still had a very few IL centers and limited number of personal assistants. But the one thing um, we were successful was um, the PA service subsidization. Um, after uh, long discussions, um, the government decided to uh, subsidize the PA services in 2011 in um, 77 provinces, plus um, three existing IL centers. So in total, we had um, 80 uh, IL centers that can provide uh, personal assistance services. Um, but one challenge that came right after was uh, the community volunteers. Um, Thailand has built quite a good community volunteer system nationwide. And because this system had already existed and the government wanted to tap into it, so they did not need to uh, create a new one. So these volunteers were trained to become personal assistants. And uh, uh, the good thing was that uh, these volunteers were available everywhere. So persons with disabilities could easily access the services. However, it didn't turn out that way. And there were some challenges, which I'll um, explain in uh, the next slide. And after 10 years uh, in uh, this year, it's time for us to actually um, evaluate and review what we have done um, to address and identify priorities and challenges and we try to fix them. Next. So basically, um, we want to expand um, the PA services because um, we do not have enough um, PA services for everyone that needs them. And the PAs who are also um, community volunteers are actually not very consistent because they have other things to do. If they have free time, they come. 
but sometimes not for assisting persons with disabilities. Rather, they come to <laughs> say hello or bring something or, uh, or donation for the clients. And some volunteers choose to work with persons with milder disabilities who live in their neighborhood, so it's easy for them to travel. But um, anyway, and the government still pays for their work. And um, the payment, uh, the next problem, uh, the next issue, uh, the next challenge is the, the payment for the service is still very low considering uh, the increased um, uh, costs of living now. And the number of hours is also not enough. The number of uh, personal assistants is not enough and there is no personalized plan. And also the next challenge is very important. Um, it's about the, the organizations of persons with disabilities themselves or the OPDs. So the OPDs that provide um, IL, the, the IL services do not um, actually show acceptable performance to the government. So therefore um, the OPD based IL centers themselves are not the best option um, for the government for expanding the PA services. So it's quite sad. And of course, um, uh, the issues of community support services and social protection programs are still persistent. Uh, persistent. Next. And now um, we are discussing with the government about what we want to change. First, um, we want to increase the, the PA wage from $1.5 dollars per hour to um, to, point two, uh, to three dollars per hour. And the Ministry, Ministry of Finance has already uh, agreed in principle, but will still need to decide um, the appropriate amount again later. We also want to increase the number of uh, the maximum hours from 180 to 240 hours per month. Um, the number the number 240 hours comes from the, uh, the maximum number of working hours per day in a period of one month, according to uh, our labor law. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's eight hours per day multiplied by 30 days. So it equals, uh, it's equal to um, 240 hours. And we also want to increase the number of PA service centers from 80 now to 881. Uh, in Thailand, we have um, 878 districts, and we also have uh, three OPD-based IL centers. So in total, um, if uh, we can make it happen, we will have 881 IL centers nationwide. And, of, and, and, and also, we want to have more professional PAs uh, for this purpose. Uh, for this purpose. Um, we also um, have some other non-numerical changes to propose. Um, first, um, we want to change the approval process. What we do now is that when the Provincial Disability Empowerment uh, Subcommittee receives a request for a PA service, uh, they only say yes or no. So in, but in the future, uh, they have to assess uh, the needs and adjust the service so that it meets the personal, uh, the personal needs. For example, if I apply for uh, a personal assistance service, I might get only five hours per month because I don't have a severe disability, but a person who has a more severe uh, disability than me might get 200 hours per month. We want to have, also we want to have um, other entities who can provide the PA services more consistently and systematically. And recently, um, the Department of Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities uh, or DP has signed an MOU with some hospitals that are interested uh, in, the, in this project. And most of them have experience providing um, community services. Now we have 100 district level hospitals and we, we will ex expand the services to all the districts nationwide in the future. And hopefully each of the 878 districts um, will have at least one uh, personal, service, personal assistance service center and apart from the OPD-based uh, personal assistance and the community volunteer personal assistance that we have, we want to also have a new source of personal assistance to make sure we can fulfill the demand uh, of the future services. 
Um, we want to also have a better uh, personal, uh, personal assistance service management system. If, uh, because uh, what, what, what uh, always happens is that when, when someone, when, when a PA cannot go uh, to provide a service for person with disability or for the clients, uh, then there's no one else to go because no one manages uh, the, 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 the service. So in the future, we hope that we can, we, we can have this system to make sure that if one cannot go, then we can find the other person and to replace. So because the service is very important and should not be missed or skipped, and hopefully um, the new system under the district hospitals will offer uh, a better one for us. And last, um, we want to um, introduce some more incentives for the PAs. Um, we are thinking of giving them some kind of, some kind of recognition uh, such as the best um, PA awards or anything along these lines. Next. Um, the new plan may sound too ambitious for us uh, considering uh, our, I mean, uh, the status of Thailand, which is the mid upper mid, uh, middle income country, but it is the way to go for us. And if we can make it happen, person with disabilities will benefit a lot from the leave frog changes and they have more, I mean, they, they'll have more PA services, more PA hours, uh, better personal, pers personalized plan, more consistent services, more, more, of course, more independent lives. But one more important aspect is that um, the PA services will prepare us for the aging society. So if you get older and you have uh, mobility problems, you, you now can apply for a disability card and then you can apply for a PA service as well. Next. Uh, of course, uh, nothing comes with the only um, positive signs. There are some challenges too. Um, we have spotted some of them already. So the first challenge is that the district, this is what we are afraid of. Uh, uh, so the, the, the district hospital personal, assist, uh, personal assistance services may reinforce uh, the medical model of disability. And in that case, um, the OPDs uh, may lose control over the key IL principles. Oh, and, and, and one of the most important principles is that the PA must assist, not make decisions or choices for persons with disabilities. But uh, without uh, truly understanding uh, this key principle, um, it can have uh, detrimental effects and uh, uh, which also affect, I mean, it will affect the quality of life of persons with disabilities in the future. So we must make sure that we can retain all the key IL principles. And last, um, having over 800 personal assistant service centers may be, like I said, uh, previ previously said, uh, a bit too ambitious, if not well-planned, because it means uh, we need a lot more PAs to recruit. Uh, we need more training, more management, and of course, financial commitment. Next. I, I guess this is the last, uh, the last slide. So um, this is all what we are doing now in um, Thailand to improve the personal assist, uh, assistance services for people with disabilities. And the PA support is one effort in pooling more community support services that we all believe um, will enable persons with disabilities to live independently with dignity in our society. Thank you for your attention. Uh, over to you, Felicity. Thanks, So Wong. It was really interesting to hear the initiatives that have been um, prioritised in Thailand over the last 10 years. And um, yeah, some ambitious um, work ahead um, with um, scaling up to such a, yeah. um, a massive degree. But yeah, that's very exciting. Thank you. Um, next, we have um, Meredith. Meredith from the ADB. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Felicity. Um, I will try and share my um, share my screen for my presentation. Okay. Um, thank Thank you, Felicity, and uh, thank you, everybody. Um, joining this, I'm going. I'm going to spend a um, a slightly different tack 
in this webinar and I'm really going to be talking about some of the sort of the community services that are emerging in the Asia and Pacific region um, for older persons and we'll do a quick tour of the region and just to highlight some of the emerging practices. But why, why is this so um, important? So obviously I, I work for the Asian Development Bank and I'm sort of focused um, on this region. And this region is aging incredibly fast. Um, it's one of the fastest aging uh, regions in the world. And as we all know, obviously um, the rates of prevalence of disability increases with age. Um, estimates are now that's about 46% of older persons um, will have some disability and globally about 250 million older persons experience moderate and severe disabilities. Um, in terms of the aging population in this region alone, you know, the numbers of older persons in the next sort of 25 to 30 years are expected to double to nearly almost 1 billion. Um, but really interestingly, the numbers of persons aged over 80 years old is nearly going to quadruple. And while this is so exciting and a real sort of um, something to celebrate, um, the rates of disability do increase quite rapidly um, once you get over 80 years old we need to prepare the services and support services for that and of course um, as we all know older persons with disabilities especially older women with disabilities are especially vulnerable and face sort of multiple um, discrimination um, just to highlight really on the on the demographic transition that is happening in the region um, so currently, you know, to be honest, most the majority of countries in the region, they're still sort of fairly, fairly young, and about half of them are what we'd classify as an aging population, where six to 13 percent of the population would be over the age of 65. Um, of course, there are countries in the region which we know have um, substantial older populations, such as Japan, Korea, Singapore. But when we look forward, to 2050, you can see that that uh, that rate of aging is going to affect sort of nearly nearly half the countries in the region. And it won't just be in East Asia, where uh, many of the super aging countries are now. It's really across uh, across the region, from sort of Georgia, Armenia, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Vietnam, China. And so really this is sort of across, um, across the whole region. I think it's only Yemen and Afghanistan will still have, um, still won't be classified as an aging country by then. So given that, obviously this issue of um, how we support older persons and older persons with functional limitations and disabilities is really coming to the fore in the region. And I'd just like to explain four, four sort of uh, programs in the region that have emerged over the last sort of 10 years or so. Uh, I'm going to start in the same country as uh, Kun Soang. It's where I'm based at the moment, um, on Thailand. Um, Thailand has introduced a national community-based long-term care programme to support um, older persons in their homes. Um, and this is a real key concept, uh, the concept of ageing in place. Um, to support older peoples in their homes and their communities rather than institutional institutions is really at the core of developing sort of good community-based services. And Thailand's community-based model really does try and support aging in place. So um, the eligibility is based on the functional assessment and what some of the key sort of elements of the Thai model is really to integrate um, community services or home-based services from trained caregivers taken from the community with, um, with health services as well, whether that be nursing or rehabilitation or so forth. And of course, it's already been highlighted, you know, also the uh, clinical devices and equipment or assisted devices as required. Um, what is interesting about this, it is actually funded under the universal health coverage um, scheme, and it's a capitated uh, payment based on uh, based on the assessment um, and so through the universal health coverage scheme the money goes through to the local authority who manage um, who manage the caregivers at the community level and there's also some allocated budget um, to the to the it says the contracted unit of primary care it is often yes the local um, health station who provide the technical assistance and the case management services 
So this is really how they've managed their personnel. They do have a case manager. They are usually um, a nurse uh, from the local um, health station. It doesn't have to be, but that's uh, what is available. And they will um, develop the, uh, the care plan and support the community caregivers in their, in their work. And there'll be about five to 10 caregivers um, to support sort of 30 to 40 older persons. As has already been highlighted, Thailand does have a very long um, history of the community health volunteers, and many of these caregivers are drawn from that with additional training. Um, one area that's been sort of very fiercely debated in Thailand is whether these caregivers um, should be paid or it should be voluntary. It's a little bit of a mix at the moment. Uh, but the, the sort of aspiration is to start formalizing that payment to them. Sort of to move on from Thailand, uh, this is sort of a really interesting model that was developed in Tonga. Um, ADB supported this uh, sort of starting back about nine or 10 years ago. And this model is really looking at supporting the capacity of government, in this case, the Ministry of Internal Affairs, in how they contract services um, to support older persons through an NGO. And so the Ministry of Internal Affairs provide the financing and the monitoring, and the NGO provide um, the, the caregivers to go and provide home visits to older persons um, and services and supplies to older persons and their families. So this has been, this was a pilot. It was quite successful. It's been taken on by the, on the government. So it has been a, sort of, um, a successful pilot. The coverage is still not um, across the whole um, of all the islands in Tonga. So it's probably sort of reaching about a quarter of the persons who have the need for it at the moment. But that's another interesting uh, model that's being developed. Um, Moving over to Vietnam, which is again aging extremely fast, um, it's a, a quite a different model being explored in Vietnam, and this is really a community driven model of um, development that's really looking at how to support um, older persons um, in the community. It's called the Intergenerational Self-Help Club. And these are groups of about 50 to 70 members, most of the majority of whom are older people. Um, and they are given a grant, a micro credit, uh, micro, um, a grant for micro credit, of which they then um, earn some money and the resources, which allows them to do their um, activities. They're extremely well trained, they're extremely well managed um, by themselves. There's a lot of input put to allow to build up their capacities. But with that, they do really um, sort of manage a holistic range of activities from micro credit and livelihoods, care and support health promotion, preparedness, and so forth. And this model has been taken on, it's recognized in national policies and promoted in um, a number of national programs. And over the last 15 years, it's sort of, there's about 4,000 of these clubs now in Vietnam. Um, in terms of what they do, in terms of the care and support to persons in the community, again, this is a, this is a purely volunteer model. They train up the volunteers who, um, and there's usually about two to three volunteers who will support an older person or a family. Um, and they'll go and provide um, help with the housework, housework um, visits, um, health monitoring, um, you know, house repairs. What is quite interesting, they also do things like they'll uh, farm some of the land, they'll feed the animals. So they really do take um, a very holistic approach to the kind of care and support um, provided. Um, in some of these uh, communities, there will be a sort of a um, sort of a retired health professional who can help um, support in some of the case management and some of the more complex conditions. I think moving forward to strengthen this model, the formalization of the links with the health um, with the health system um, would help a little bit. Um, the very last, place I'll go to in the region is Indonesia and this is um, also sort of a really exciting development that ADB um, is working with the government of Indonesia on. Indonesia again has a very very uh, sort of long and vibrant history of community support and different types of community organization that support families and older persons but the real um, 
The real challenge in Indonesia is really coordination. So what the central government are doing, they've really sort of identified, you know, what are going to be some of the key enablers that we can bring in um, a coordinated and integrated system. So they're really focusing on an information system, um, a case management system, um, and supported by community care hubs um, at the village level. And the three of these will really work on sort of horizontal integration um, initially with the vision of working to a fully integrated system um, going forward. So that's really, really exciting. Um, and it's been, yes, it's being sort of targeted in their medium term development plan as well. So we should see some exciting developments from Indonesia over the next few years. So just to summarize, you know, I think um, in the region, you know, the concept of aging in place is well accepted. Um, there isn't the assumption that older people will be institutionalized. I can be quite frank, sometimes aging in place is taken to mean the families can do everything. Um, so that there is that need to be sort of quite a lot of work on identifying and sharing good examples of what care services and support services can be brought in. Um, there's quite a lot of recognition of the importance of integrated and coordinated services but of course we know the devil in the detail on how to do that um, and in most of these countries and other countries you know this is supported by uh, policy development and program implementation um, from the models that i've shown obviously i've shown some of the successful models but the pilots pilots in thailand and tonga have been able to be scaled up but as you would have seen, there is a strong focus on home care visits, but each country does have a plan for expanding the scope of services. So there would be a wider range of community services for um, families and older persons. Um, again, I think in each model, the engagement of the communities in designing, delivering and supporting these services has been absolutely key. And of course, you know, in most countries, this has been supplemented by cash transfers and has already been highlighted that is the programs for home modification and assisted devices in Thailand. But all of these countries uh, do struggle with a sort of an, a lack of coverage of the services. And as you'll have seen from the benefit packages, they are quite limited. You know, the adequacy of services, the, the visits are only sort of two to three times um, a week, which isn't really sufficient uh, for, for the for the requirements. Um, there is still an over-reliance on families and volunteers, uh, but you know, the, the recognition that um, for this kind of support services, this does need to be paid and trained workers is growing. A big challenge is on the responsibilities, um, especially for long-term care. Is it the social ministries? What's the role of the social ministries? What's the role of the health, health authorities um, and other organization and who takes the lead and where the authorities are, again, with the local authorities. And of course, financing remains to be the key challenge um, in terms of scaling up some of these um, great initiatives. Thank you. Thanks, Meredith. It was um, really interesting to see the demographic aging profile for our region. It's um, pretty stark. <laughs> um, great to see some interesting community care models being established across the region too, though. Just um, a reminder to everyone that we're going to have a Q&A &A session after all the guest speakers tonight. We're on to our lucky last speaker. Um, who I'll hand over to in a minute. But if you do have any questions, please get them into the Q&A box, which you can find in the menu at the bottom of your screen. Okay, over to you, Tom. Thank you very much. And it's good to be with you all. Um, I'm gonna talk about disability and gender considerations in relation to the care economy. And that hasn't come up and yet it's absolutely central. Um, so first of all, what is the issue? We know there are a billion disabled people in the world. Um, as we've heard, there's increasing numbers of older people. By 2030, there'll be 1.4 billion people over 60 in the world, of whom 424 million will be aged over 80. But I want you to remember that care and support is about disability at all ages. In this webinar, we've heard about children, uh, of pe of people of uh, working age and older people, and disability is all of these groups. 
So when we hear this language, and sometimes it is about time bomb or dependency or burden, uh, increasing numbers of disabled and old people is evidence actually of success. We want this. We want to live longer and indeed better lives. And if we get enabling environments and access to assistive technology, then people will be more independent and less reliant on others. And that's what we want. Um, if we empower disabled people, they will be able to participate and require less support and assistance from others. So in the last 20 years and more, there's been a great expansion in the care work sector. States have contracted out to the voluntary, but especially the for-profit private sector to develop, develop, deliver care services. And so particularly in um, uh, uh, high income countries, this has encouraged the development of home-based, often low paid commodified care or domestic help. So this is very much according to market principles. And that means that domestic and care, wear, care work have everything that you associate with non-standard employment. They're often temporary, part-time, precarious, low-waged, insecure, flexible, uh, and without collective organization or trade unions. And the low value attached to care and support work in many countries means that it's those with the least bargaining power who find work there. And that's often women, older people, migrant workers. Across the world, it is women who provide most care, both as paid care workers in the formal and informal economy, and as unpaid carers in the home, as we've just heard. Women make up 65% of the global care workforce. Care work makes up nearly 20% of women's paid employment. So often when women get jobs, they're getting jobs in care and support. And as I've heard, formal care work is often low paid, unrecognized as skilled labor. And women's domestic caring practices are often taken for granted, assumed to be part of women's natural duties. And even in high income countries like Sweden, the majority of support given to disabled and older people is unpaid care. And of course, as well as the gendered nature, uh, often care workers are also migrants. Care and domestic workers migrate across the global North and South and also within these regions. For example, in Spain and Italy, 63% and 73% respectively, of care workers are migrants. Um, and since 2004, there's been an increase in educated young women migrants from Central and Eastern Europe, finding care and domestic work in Northern, Western, and a little bit Southern Europe. Um, and wide, more widely afield, we know that domestic workers from Indonesia go to Malaysia, Singapore, and Saudi Arabia, where the money is. Domestic workers from Philippines go all over the wealthy world. And the challenge we face is to ensure that everyone is supported and included, and that neither disabled and older people nor their unpaid carers or paid caregivers are at risk of exclusion or disempowerment. For example, younger people who care for older family members, disabled family members may be excluded from school, uh, adult women may be excluded from the labor force. And this is bad for them, and it's bad for uh, uh, the, 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 the economy and the system more generally. Now, one answer to the social exclusion of care workers is independent living or personal assistance as made mandated in the CRPD. And in the UK, it appears, and this is where I've done my research mainly, it appears that many workers prefer being personal assistants to working with for agencies as a home care worker or working in residential care. In England, an estimated 70,000 disabled people are employing 145,000 personal assistants. And these personal assistants, of course, are mostly women. So note that in England, this is still far fewer people than are receiving home care. Within personal assistance, there's more flexibility, uh, uh, positive relationships, developing over time between employer and worker are more rewarding. People feel positive about their role in empowering disabled people. And that's why the, the turnover of staff is much lower than for the social care sectors as a whole. 
And in the UK, the real term hourly pay rate for assistance has actually gone down since 2008. But still, the flexibility and positive working conditions make it desirable for many workers to work in personal assistance. And indeed, the average hourly pay is higher than in the rest of the social care sector. Because as austerity policies have squeezed local authority, that's uh, local government budgets, it's easier to reduce the hours granted to disabled people or limit the hourly rates that can be paid. And what this means is that disabled people lose out on independence, support workers lose out in terms of decent paying conditions. And remembering these support workers are usually women. Now, disabled people uh, within personal assistance are free to employ, employ who they wish, to organize their support how they desire, um, and they have relationships which are not, um, they don't have oversight from government professional or third sector agencies. And this freedom and flexibility does offer great rewards because when disabled people have control over their support arrangements, it leads to better outcomes for everybody. But there are also risks and issues of concern. Because for example, workers for disabled people as personal assistants are often working alone. Their workplace is sometimes the disabled person's own home. Their work is often part-time, informal, flexible. It's unregulated, rarely unionized. So there's scope for abuse or exploitation of either the disabled employer, who's often in a vulnerable position, or the employee, who may be, as I said, women, new migrant, unable to exit the situation, particularly if they live in. Now, these extremes of abuse are rare, but they are common. So every uh, person that we spoke to in our study, that's 70 people, had heard of these stories, but they're still rare. Uh, but even without these extremes, PA relationships can be demanding and emotionally fraught. So what can we do about them? Well, for a start, third sector organizations, disabled people's organizations, similar independent living organizations, they can mitigate the, some of these problems. And also training, training for disabled people in being an employer, training for workers, support workers in what personal assistance means, may improve relations and outcomes. That's what we've learned in the UK and that's what we suggest for other countries. Um, even in high income countries like the UK or Sweden, fewer people with intellectual disabilities have independent living. For people with intellectual disabilities, living and being included in the community, Article 19 of the CRPD, means having friends, living a typical life. But often I'm afraid that communities are not very welcoming or accepting. Um, mostly people with intellectual disabilities live with families. Some are confined to institutions. Um, in low income settings, particularly Africa and similar low income settings, there is less support to families, um, except sometimes through churches and faith organizations. And uh, Inclusion International, um, an African researcher concluded about families with uh, children with intellectual disabilities, many are stumbling in the dark trying to find the right path unassisted. The vast majority are trying to offer their child a decent life, sometimes at enormous personal cost, both emotional and financial. So families bear the cost of these efforts to promote well-being, and often it's women that bear the cost. Um, now, independent living, as I've said, is mostly an option in high-income countries like Britain, America, and the Northern European countries. But in many of them, in the Netherlands, in Sweden, in UK, in other countries, there have been cutbacks in eligibility for independent living during the last 10 years of austerity. And the current COVID pandemic has also seen more social care cuts. And of course, people are working more at home so they can do more of these tasks for their own family. And they may be anxious about strangers coming to the home. And so they may have canceled their contracts for personal assistance. They may have delivered the care themselves. Um, again, unpaid women have delivered the care. But what it's meant is that uh, many uh, young people or others who deliver care are, have been redundant within the pandemic. Now, more high middle income settings to bring in independent living programs, for example, Peru or Thailand, as we've heard today from Sawang. Um, but many middle and low income countries will not find it possible to fund direct payments for personal assistance. 
Although wealthy families in low income settings may find it easier to pay economically disadvantaged individuals, often migrant women workers, to support their disabled or elderly family members. So even in low income countries, rich people can employ um, personal assistance. And as I say, they're usually women. So even in national contexts where state funds are not available to provide personal assistance or support workers, the principles of independent living are very important. These principles emphasize choice and control of persons with disabilities as a means to independence, inclusion, and participation in society. Those providing unpaid assistance to disabled people, whether family members or volunteers, should also respect the will and preferences of the disabled individual and empower them to participate in the community. And of course, again, women are key to the empowerment of persons with disabilities. Now, we need to remember, as well as personal assistance, care workers and unpaid carers, mostly being women, the majority of disabled people are also women, particularly older women. Um, and I think it's true to say that women have been somewhat marginalized in the disabled people's movement. A report on disability policy in Europe concluded more needs to be done to accommodate women's needs. For example, by providing kindergarten places, maternity need, leave, and where needed personal assistance that will allow mothers with disabilities to combine family obligations and paid work in the ordinary labor market. Gender and disability and often racial injustice is compounded. So let me conclude. The inclusion of unpaid and domestic work, unpaid care and domestic work in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development has been extremely significant in making care and support central to sustainable development. And what's vital here is the triple R framework. And that means recognition, reduction, and redistribution of unpaid care and domestic work. So that's recognition, reduction, and redistribution of unpaid care and domestic work. And I just want to take here the example of Uruguay, which is a good example because it's had a rights-based approach to care and to social protection. Um, and its social protection programs have been extended to include SNIC, which is the Uruguayan Integrated National Care System. And that involves early childcare, parental leave, cash transfers for care responsibilities, and employer responsibilities for work-life balance. So SNIC is a fourth pillar of the social protection system, along with health, education, and social security. And this settlement in Uruguay, it was the consequence of alliances between women's movements, social movements, disability movements, feminist academics, and female politicians, which managed to bring together the claims of unpaid and paid care workers. And I want to conclude now by saying that these sorts of alliances, and above all, the alliance between women and persons with disabilities and older persons, these connections are vital to the future of support and assistance and to achieving a gender responsive community support system that we all want. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much, Tom, for your presentation. Um, it was um, really good to cover off on the, um, the gender issues with regards to this issue. We'll move now on to um, a quick question and answer um, session. We don't have much time left, um, but Tom, the first question I might just hand over to you while you're on a roll, but I was wondering if you have seen any good examples of um, where social protection um, has been able to step in to provide um, support to personal assistants and carers um, and kind of maybe subsidise wages or things like that um, to, for them to provide um, care in the care economy to um, persons with a disability. I mean, I think there, I, I, I don't have a perfect example. I think that across the high income world, there are some benefits for care workers, um, and there are um, personal assistance uh, at work um, and similar uh, like access to work in the UK, similar schemes.
but they, for example, the payments to um, domestic care workers very rarely um, uh, meet the, the hourly needs of families. And so, for example, families with disabled children, often the, the one person, usually the wife, stops work to look after the disabled child. And of course, many disabled children have uh, health appointments, all sorts of therapies. And so it's very difficult to combine that with regular work. So we still haven't cracked the problem um, of including a care system which really supports everybody, both disabled and older people, and women and other caregivers. Um, we've still still some way to go. Um, and uh, you know, in somewhere like Sweden, where women are working in much greater numbers than most other high-income countries, it still tends to be women who are paid to look after uh, the children uh, and indeed disabled people. So we still haven't practiced um, and, and we need to remember it and carry on working in this area to improve situations. Yeah, yeah, we do have a long way to go. Thanks, Tom. Um, recognition of that important care work is an important first step. Um, Meredith, I have um, one question for you. Um, I'm just wondering if you could um, talk a little bit more about the connection that you see between support for older persons and um, the support for working age adults with um, disabilities as well. Okay, thank you. Well, I think there still needs to be a bit of a um, sort of a transformation, like in the in the design of the all the examples that were presented, you know, Thailand, um, Thailand and Tonga, the initial priority for the older persons in terms of the criteria really is on that functional dependence. Um, in Thailand, it's sort of very uh, much focused on bed bound persons and it's really about sort of uh, providing that um, companionship, that clinical care, that personal care, etc. But, you know, in some, um, and in terms of broadening it out to really be able to engage um, older persons with functional uh, dependency in the wider community and really support the independence, I don't think it's quite there yet because that the systems have to start somewhere and they tend to start um, at that. But I would say, like, like I mentioned, I really see um, through this, you know, there is a, a desire to broaden out the community services um, to really be able to support um, older persons to be, to be more um, engaged. Um, I think one thing that isn't really very well um, addressed and I think it's something that you know often the long-term care system you know even the even the name of it it's you know the criteria is based on age that's the first um criteria so in Thailand it's 60 and so forth and there's very clear cut off and some countries you know there's a there's two systems for persons with disability and care systems and you might even just jump over the system depending on your age so in terms of a fully sort of integrated um, life cycle system as Tom was highlighting um, there's still quite a lot of work to do in many of these places yes yes thanks Meredith um I can't see any more questions in the um the chat bar or the Q&A so we might wind up um we've only got a few minutes left anyway um, so just a reminder that this webinar has been recorded and it will go up on the socialprotection.org website in the next week or so. Um, you'll be able to access um, the recording and you will all receive an email um, when that um, is um, ready to go up on the, web, um, the website. Um, there's another upcoming webinar on um, Tuesday the 14th of October that I wanted to draw your attention to that you might be interested in and it's on traditional transitioning from the humanitarian crash to social protection in um, protracted crises and it will be looking at the case of Iraq and so that's on Tuesday the 14th of October and you can register for that webinar on the socialprotection.org website um, so um, if you do have any further questions of us um, that you'd like to pose offline you can always get in touch with us um, 
uh, my email address will be up on the website um, linked to this webinar and I can forward um, any questions that you have on to our panelists. And um, yeah, please do remember to sign up to the socialprotection.org website so that you um, are aware of all the upcoming webinars that we have coming up on more, more we'll have more coming up on disability issues, but there's so many webinars happening every week on social protection issues. Um, I'd like to thank all our wonderful speakers for taking the time to um, present some really um, important issues to us all tonight on community care for persons with a disability. So a round of applause for everyone. Thanks um, to our wonderful staff behind the scenes from the socialprotection.org um, um, website. Um, and also thank you to our sign language interpreters and our captioners who have been working very hard to provide the, the captions and the sign language interpretation for us tonight. And we hope to see you again soon. Thanks, bye.